but to love me is better than all things. If under the night stars, in the desert, you presently burn my innocence before me, invoking me with a pure heart, and the serpent flame therein, you shall come a little to lie in my bosom. For one kiss will you then be willing to give all. But whosoever give one particle of dust shall lose all in that hour. You shall gather goods and store of women and spices. You shall wear rich jewels. You shall exceed the nation of the earth in splendor and pride, but always in the love of me. And so shall you come to my joy. I charge you earnestly to come before me in a single robe, and covered with rich headdress. I love you. I yearn to you, pale or purple, veiled or voluptuous, I, who am all pleasure and purple, and drunkenness of the innermost sense, desire you, put on the wings and arouse the coiled splendor within you. Okay. I'm Mark Morgan, this is the Egyptian Magic Podcast. Returning to the issue of a goddess knew it, or sometimes, well, knew it, N-U-I-T is a kind of uh, Victorian way of pronouncing it. Could be newt, a newet. Uh, Usually kind of transliterated as NWT just to make it awkward anyway. Okay, so I opened, uh, th this little film opens eventually with with a, just a little section from uh, Alistair Crowley's text or channeled text, something, a sacred text that he channeled uh, from his spirit guides known as the Book of the Law. It's very famous of course. Uh, and also breaks down into three parts as all the best bits do and the first part is devoted to the goddess Nuit who, which is also the subject of this um, podcast, this lecture or talk or whatever you want to call it uh, and Crowley often gets a bad press of course but one of the most important aspects from my point of view about Crowley is very interesting is that he kind of focuses on this goddess Nuit from the Egyptian tradition that in a way is, is quite an odd choice you'd think he'd be into Isis and or as more well known at the time because we're talking about about a hundred years ago or so now more than a hundred years 110 years I think uh, but nevertheless, he brings this goddess Nuit, the mother of the gods in the Egyptian traditions, to the fore. And he writes this, or channels this, a bit of both, I would thought, amazing uh, mystical poem uh, and invocation and sacred text to the goddess Nuit. And I kind of always think it's worth emphasizing that when he did that, when he brought that attention to that goddess back into the magical tradition it, it was an in, incredibly perceptive thing to do people often disparage his knowledge of ancient religions and egyptology which has advanced such a lot since his day and perhaps he didn't always have the best informants but i think that insight of crowley you're never going to take it away from him because not only is it important in terms of uh, understanding the Egyptian uh, mythical, magical tradition, it's also an incredibly important mystery for uh, modern magic and alchemy. Anything you call you want to include in your magical tradition, all of it will have been kind of adumbrated, will have been covered within the uh, ancient mythology of the goddess Nuit 
uh, and this was a particularly important, as, as I'm going to say in a moment, to people who we might who were similar to the path that some of us are following in the modern world as kind of Gnostics or modern Gnostics or magicians pursuing some sort of deep inner knowledge. And so she's not just an interesting goddess, a very uh, attractive and distinctive and uh, striking goddess within within the tradition. She, her, her text and her presence is very much more central to the nature of magic than we ever realized he, that Crowley even realized at the time that he was channeling that is this is something that new texts have kind of emphasized again and again that she is in terms of her surviving records uh, of the of mythology incredibly important and full of mystical knowledge that we really do need is very very relevant to the modern world and is still living because she's connected with the stars it's a living tradition so i just wanted to say that with respect to uh alistair crowley who did so much to revive and promulgate the the magical system into into our times Knew it is um, is a is, is an important goddess within the Egyptian tradition and important for all sorts of magic as well. Quite uh, now and then, uh, although this this knowledge wasn't always completely known. And as I've been kind of researching this, I thought I should tell you a bit more about it. She's a very kind of uh, famous goddess. The, uh, largest image i'll put an image on the on the thing largest of all images of gods and goddesses found anywhere in in egypt in a sort of temple like dendra there are these real colossal pictures of the goddess knew it uh, and that is appropriate because one of her main uh, functions is as representing the stars the stars in the day and the stars at night the whole of the sky really so she is colossal because the sky itself is colossal and a, a great deal of egyptian mythology and egyptian uh, magical ideas and philosophical and theological ideas are connected with with the goddess knew it and anybody who is interested in um, the deeper aspects of uh, egyptian magic is going to have to kind of encounter her the adepts in egypt itself which is the existence of the idea of a group of adepts or a mystery tradition in egypt is not something that is widely agreed on i think it's the the academic community if you, if you take their view as being important say this is contested idea the, the idea obviously there's religion and there are priests and all the rest but the idea that there might be a special semi-secret group of people who are not just going through the paces of the egyptian sort of cult if you like the daily offerings and the kind of uh, annual rituals and all the rest but uh devoted on a more mystical uh, Gnostic quest for uh, a higher knowledge of the inner mysteries of that tradition. Uh, there are references in, to in, even in ordinary hymns to the fact that these people existed and I've talked about it many times how there's a growing body of evidence that there was this group of of people who you know you could say that they were at the very least they were the scribes they were the people who kind of put together the written tradition who were there to write letters and to to transcribe sort of uh, text from one manuscript to another and make copies of them and, and learn the whole art and craft of of uh, writing and uh, and of composing material and they in a sense they're more important as a as a social group than the 
than than the priests who kind of have a certain set of instructions that they have to go through. The, the scribes are much more intellectual group of people by the look of it. So their training would take uh, a definite period of time and, uh, and there's also an, an initiation. You have to be initiated into that tradition. Uh, the question is when it went further than that, than just the art and craft of writing and transcribing these texts, whether they went into the aspect of interpreting and finding the origin of developing, of actually writing these texts in the first place, not just describing the ones from tradition, but how do these mythological texts and visions come into existence in the first place? Somebody must have compiled them and for that you need a group of um, experts or people who were initiated into tradition and deaf and interpret the tradition from uh, going on and why I mention them is because the goddess uh, knew it is one of the important uh, entities involved in the training and of or, and the mysteries of this this group it seems to be that anybody who went through a kind of experience a peak experience in in what's known as the dark chamber or the resurrection chamber they would have a certain set of of books that were kind of key to the to their kind of movement through the system kind of like we talk about the people of the book people usually assume that's that's connected with things like the bible or the quran or whatever but even in the ancient world people were very very um obsessed you'd say with and, and, and attracted and interested in 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 books those who were part of the literary tradition anyway and these adepts would have certain set of special books uh canonical books uh sometimes called the primary corpus which they need to know quite well and they also as a physical entity they have to have them around them at, at the point in which they're kind of undergoing some sort of psychic transformation or journey into the underworld and i mention that because several of the books that were the part of this primary corpus are always connected with uh, the goddess knew it and a little later on i'm going to read a kind of adaptation of uh, of of the uh, what's called the dramatic text of new it which comes from the osirion in uh, abydos uh, or other places perhaps because uh, there are other osirions and this text is a kind of uh, a drama that uh, what I brought out in my version, in which one reenacts or, or with this goddess the process of um, death, you enter into the death posture, which is kind of what meditation is a sort of calming down, uh, a process of uh, dissolving of the personality and all the physical parts until you get to a point of a one pointed state or to a, a point of stillness at the center, which is envisaged as being in the womb of the, the underworld, um, but also within the body of this colossal goddess knew it. And the dramatic text kind of confused people at first when they first, when, when it was first discovered and translated because the drama is, is rather odd. She's kind of, uh, referred to in what we think of as quite disparaging terms as someone who actually even though she's the mother of the gods she's also quite a cruel mother I suppose on the on the face of it according to the text because she actually eats her own children and and uh, her kind of consort her partner partner was the earth god Geb actually gets into a in the dramatic gets him in a kind of row with her about the fact that these children that they have created in the past that she keeps eating them again i.e killing them in in, a, in in essence which is connected with the idea why why we say the goddess knew it is connected with this thing called the death posture the death meditation 
because the process of um, of death precedes that of birth within the Egyptian view. It's almost it is like the kind of death and rebirth thing, or or kind of dissolving and then reconstitution. So that that feature of it, where he he's, he's called a a sow in a sow who eats her own piglet piglets, is one of the accusations Geb levies at her and the other gods say oh well you don't really understand what is what this is all about and god in fact the god thoth intervenes and says you, you to Geb, you know forget it you don't really understand the process because all things have to die in order to be reborn essentially and this is envisaged as, as entering into the mouth of the of the of the god this giant goddess of the stars knew it entering into the stars by a process of being eaten which is also as i say death but also dismemberment of course because in order for something to eat it it be eaten it has to be dismembered in terms of the moment within this the um, astrological year or the ritual year in which this eating takes place it's usually said to be around about the equinox so i was talking about the astrological year uh the equinox primarily the equinoxes and solstices which is another aspect of uh, egyptian ritual year that is not well explained or known people assume it's there but it there's no obvious festivals are a little bit secret in their own ways although they do play a part in the mythology in terms of things like it's often envisaged as the goddess going away to the south and the great return and the solstice is kind of the moment in which the return begins the great return it's not obvious yet the the sun has gone its furthest south for us right in the northern hemisphere in terms of its its journey through the through the cycle of the earth around the, the ecliptic and its apparent position from the earth is this further south and solstice is the time when the nights begin to get uh, longer again although the, this effect is not obvious for quite a long time there's a sort of lag if you like or whatever this was envisaged as, as a point of return but the other interesting thing that happened in terms of the mythology of newt on um, the equinox itself just to start from there <coughs> which be obvious why i'm talking about the old, uh, equinox in a moment is that if you were looking at the night sky and you're lucky enough to have a kind of nice clear horizon and all the rest and you're looking towards the the west which is thought of as the place of death uh, and where the entrance into the underworld and the place of death the sun would as all stars do would uh, set in the west as it does uh, and the day would end and the stars would eventually come out and one of the things that you would notice at the equinox is that a part of the constellation of um, the Mil we call the Milky Way, which is a, another way of envisaging this goddess uh, knew it. She's the personification of all stars, but specifically she's the personification of what is known in many cultures as the Milky Way or the Celestial Waterway is a, another name for it. And if you look at the Milky Way, it does kind of look like a, a very long female body stretched right across from north to south across the the sky, and we only see bits of it at, at, at a time. Uh, but anyway, at, at the equinox, the part of the Milky Way which corresponds to this model of the uh, mouth and head of the of the goddess, knew it would rise uh, as the stars became visible that would be the part the, the part of the milky way that you you saw at the at the equinox so in effect the mouth of the goddess would 
appear on the horizon just after the sun god or the sun had gone below the horizon in the west and you could see how people might fit these things together that uh, the sun has entered into the mouth of of the Milky Way into the mouth of knew it as they're one and the same and also it would be as if they'd been eaten by the, the goddess knew it and uh, that's and then there's an elaborate series of mystical texts that tell you what happens after that that moment of eating okay so that's at the equinox so it's no coincidence then obviously that nine months later which is the the human period of uh, gestation in within the body of the mother brings us to the winter solstice and at the winter solstice the sun emerges uh, in the east uh, is born is reborn uh, if you're lucky enough to see the sky how this would be visioned in the sky would be again uh, the, the part of the milky way that corresponds to uh, the womb and the, the yoni, the vagina of the of the goddess, knew it, would be visible in the skies, in the stars, just before sunrise, where it would be the, some of the last stars to appear. So the uh, the birth of the god also corresponds with, with the kind of presence of the birth canal of the this of the goddess who gives birth to him in terms of the celestial sphere so that was something that was obviously noticed by uh ancient people certainly by the egyptians quite a long time ago and perhaps the mythology is a way of making sense of of that these are or the other way around who knows you you explain it but uh in terms of um actual stars as well constellations because you ha you have the milky way but you have particular groups of stars within the body of new as well which co often correspond with particular gods and goddesses and i think i'm right in saying that it would be uh cygnus the swan that would be visible in the in the night sky about now if we could see the night sky where i am we're not can't see it at the moment it's all clouded uh, and the swan or, or the goose of some sort is often connected with it in mythology with the process of uh, birth there's kind of bits of folklore there's a folklore of um, the stork which is kind of sort of you could say it's almost like a swan I certainly fly in bird delivering the uh, the souls of the newborn babies just before that physical birth that's a common piece of mythology in places i live also within plato i think you you have this idea that uh, when you die uh, and your soul transmigrates to uh, another body uh, in the, uh, having spent a period of time in this sort of limbo or this other world before the process of rebirth takes place that it, the form it takes in the underworld or uh, in the other world, whichever it is, is as a, a flying bird, as a swan. And you get similar things in Hindu mythology as well. So it's obviously a, a common ground, a common way of looking at this process of death and rebirth, which is a, another interesting aspect of the, the notion of rebirth. We know a lot about the kind of physical resurrection culture of uh, Egyptian way of looking at things but uh, alongside that is this idea of death and rebirth uh, or perhaps death and regeneration within life as well the, the two ideas are not really contradictory they seem to kind of play together they seem to kind of feed into each other and this is something you find within the Egyptian culture. So the solstice we're at is, is what's why they call it in lots of mythologies, the birth of the sun. There are some variations on this. It must be obvious that you could have the process of uh, conception of eating taking place at the autumn equinox. Uh, 
and then the birth would be on the summer solstice and both those arrangements that exist within Egypt as well depend on which bit of Egypt you're in if you're in the upper or lower Egypt uh, sometimes the birth of the sun is said to take place at the winter solstice and, and in other parts of Egypt the birth of the sun is in business happening at the summer solstice uh, and that you know it, it, you just have to live with that it's often the way why there are there are often some contradictions between the different mythological schema it's often down to the fact that there's no one overall system within Egyptian magic uh, and why should there be there are kind of different views according to different people and where maybe where they live and the things that are important to them but the the thing that is the same is this idea of um, death and, and rebirth being a pattern that is discernible in the stars and this is particularly important for this time of year as it happens all these events that occur within the ritual year which we decided is sacred to the goddess Nuit, uh, <coughs> which spans this whole region of rebirth it's totally appropriate um, and this is the, one of the things i wanted to to explain so in the little invocation that i suggest for uh knew it i should say there's an awful lot of other things that we could say about the uh, goddess knew it she's incredibly important within the egyptian tradition and uh, occurs in doesn't have a temple of her own but seems to be part of everybody's cult one way or another they always have representations of her even if not on the colossal scale that you find at a place like Dendera, which has several colossal images of uh, of Nuit. But most of the different aspects of a mythology are all connected with the same sort of thing, with uh, conception and rebirth, or birth, if you like, in the first place. So where she takes the form of the, the, the uh, heavenly cow, the cow goddess which is another Im important and ancient way of envisaging uh, the goddess Nuit uh, again it's it's very connected with conception and birth the cow being as this kind of female very nurturing um, entity animal in real life and in terms of mythology as well it's also emphasized in terms of the the kind of imagery and spells and books that you see in the funerary cult itself and in a, it sees one of these goddesses that can also take on the form of a, a coffin and which would mean that she's actually represented as inside the coffin often on the floor or, or the uh, the lid of the coffin so that the deceased is kind of enfolded within the image of uh, new as they as they die and undertake their their journey of transformation and, and rebirth and this is an image that i've shared many times of the image of new it from the coffin of seti the first at uh, not abydos but uh, from his tomb in the uh, valley of the kings which is rather magnificent tomb as most of his monuments are one way or another and the coffin was taken away by early archaeologists or tomb raiders if you prefer and it lives in london now but uh, this is rather handy at the moment because you can see this masterpiece with an image of newit which i've reproduced on a shroud which i use in my own version of uh, the, the death posture, death and rebirth posture, probably we should call it more accurately. And uh, also around the coffin, as I've explained many times, is another important book that tells you what happens within the body of Newit. And it's rather kind of appropriate that this is carved on the on the sides of the, the coffin. So you've got the image of knew it into whose arms and wings you are enfolded and then you've got this description of the different transformations that you're going to undergo 
within your body before you are either resurrected or reborn into a, a new existence, which is totally appropriate. Um, so, you you is very important goddess. Um, lots of things to learn about her, not just in terms of the broader mythology and theology of <laughs> what happens to us after death, but what we can do, these texts are great for the living as well. They're for the benefit of the living so that they can, I suppose, broadly say, practice the, the process of resurrection or as a one of the most common elements of magic and uh, meditation and mysticism is, the, is, is reenacting the process of uh, death and rebirth or dissolving of the structure and rebuilding it which has benefits for the physical organism but also it provides this deep knowledge of uh, the nature of the cosmos prepares you for the real process of death perhaps so that you can <coughs> have a, a good rebirth but one one way or another this is the magic one of the more important of the magical meditations is the ability to let go of the, the structure, to understand the structure uh, that, that, that appears so uh, solid but it actually can be dissolved and dissolve it just enough so there's something left so that it can be put back together again. The god set that I'm particularly fond of, who is often referred to as uh, the son of Nuit. Uh, so their connection is quite strong. One of the reasons would be at that moment of uh, transition in the womb uh, when kind of you're almost gone, when you're almost being blown away, if you like, all the elements of God, he is there to kind of give, to finally hold it together and prevent any, this is quite small and vulnerable, prevent any kind of exterior forces from destroying it in its moment of weakness. So Set is there to kind of hold things together and defend the kind of the soul, the monad from the external, what we would call demons, whatever they are, just it could just be chaos or whatever. Sometimes it's physics is quite an important thing. An awful lot of magic historically stems from that, that, that process and set is there uh, as uh, a son of Nuit to protect the soul in its process of uh, transformation uh, and you know because he's there at such a dangerous moment when it appears that you're being killed and brought back to life um, he is often thought of as quite demonic is sometimes why it's, uh, we've talked about it as being a demonic initiation perhaps unfairly because the process inevitably involves quite a certain amount of danger of ego loss i suppose used to be the danger they talk about uh, and it, it looks quite traumatic but it's it, almost we have no choice this is the way the system works this is the process of of uh, of death and rebirth in physical life but also in terms of consciousness and understanding things and some religious groups are quite afraid of this process magic and the gnostic tradition is embraces it they said this is the way things are and you, you, just because you look away and you, you don't um, want to think about this uh, it's too too frightening you want to call it demonic you're playing with consciousness it 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 still happens it's going to happen to you one day wherever way you look at it and the, the philosophy is that uh, the more one is prepared for this the kind of uh, the easier or more rational the process is rather than kind of if you panic or whatever so it's it's a constant exercise Perhaps you do this all the time in your meditation one way or another. You certainly do it every night when you go to sleep and wait and suddenly something wakes up at some point and your the whole system clicks back to life. So the process is 
it's not saying this is something you should say this is a description of what of of the mystery of consciousness that has all these broader levels and is also connected with the mysteries of reproduction um, as it was envisaged all of these models stem from the reproductive model anyway i shall Finish there. I shall illustrate this hopefully with lots of uh, with the such pictures that I have, uh, which are fascinating. Uh, say also in other films we've talked about it. the decanal system, which is this sequence of steps or time measurement that is also connected with the goddess Nuit. And uh, in some of the pictures, the different decans are described within the text that's written over the body of of Nuit. so but that, that's a whole another mystery that we're, we're working on steadily i shall then finish with uh, another recording appending to this another recording of uh, my simplification rendering into three parts of the dramatic text of Nuit, which I suggest, uh, as I say in the description again, that you could use this as a, as a model for the death and rebirth posture because it seems to have this model of entry into, into death, residence within the other world, which is inside the body of Nuit, the sort of uh, dissolving and then the reconstitution, and then the process of coming forth. the process of coming forth. Stars that sail out at night to the limits of the sky outside of your body shine and be seen. And in the daytime you sail inside of her, the star goddess, and are not seen. So enter with the sun god Ra and go forth after him, traveling with him on her body supported by Shu, who settles you in the night sky, where the sun god Ra sets in the western horizon. Your head will be in the west, and enter her mouth, and she shall eat you. So the so-called dramatic text of Nuit functions as a meditation on death and rebirth. So what I've done is uh, rearranged it slightly to kind of bring out that aspect to it. Where the star goddess knew it is the mediator, really, in the uh, Egyptian way of looking at things, of all kind of this process of dissolution and death, uh, and then regeneration inside her body which is also inside the deepest point of the earth so after the the beginning the first uh, passage if you like there's you could have a pause to think about the process of uh, dissolution of the uh, dissolving into the into the earth inside the body of new earth First of all, she is envisaged as, as her eating the sun, eating any entity, really, eating all of the stars, and also us. This is how we kind of enter into the body of, of Nuit by being eaten, which is in a sense like being dismembered or, I suppose, it happens at death. This is what happens to us. We enter into the body of Nuit uh, in their way of looking at this and we stay within the body of it for the process of uh, regeneration whether that's the nine months or the 70 days in some ways of looking at it whatever a suitable period of time for regeneration and silent reflection if you're following this as a as a meditation so as i say the invocation which i'll repeat in a moment begins with uh, the process of uh, entering into the body of Nuit, uh, into the earth. Then 
the, the, the middle part of the poem is or invocation is is the process of being within the body of of dissolving and of uh, looking at all the different elements in, within the life and, and going through various transformations in, which take us back like a fish which is like a like a seed really uh, as like the semen or the kind of egg uh, sort of moving around which is the way they would have seen it all of this is modeled on uh, reproduction the kind of gradual putting back together of uh, uh, of the body uh, through the various transformations and then the fi final bit is is likened to the point of sunrise when one comes out of the out of the underworld out of the body of new and is reborn regenerated into a new life and this is a this is a continuous uh, eternal cycle of death and rebirth which in the meditation in the poem one re-enacts in one's mind's eye in a form of a meditation stars that sail out at night to the limits of the sky outside of your body shine and be seen and in the daytime you sail inside of her the star goddess and are not seen so enter with the sun god ra and go forth after him traveling with him on her body supported by shu who settles you in the night sky where the sun god ra sets in the western horizon your head will be in the west and enter her mouth and she shall eat you you stars go into the earth you die and enter the duart and stop in the house of geb for a while regenerating losing your impurities to the earth then as a shining star rise again at the end of the period of regeneration tears may fall and become as fish in a lake where the life of a star begins as a fish it grows and goes forth from the water from the sea it flies upwards to the sky from its former self it flies upwards to the sky and with its former self it rises as a star with all other stars that go forth from the duart and withdraw across the sky thus is all life seen the stars will go forth outside of me the sky goddess knew it proceeding as they do and returning this never-ending cycle of death and rebirth as the sun succeeds the father so the new moon succeeds the full one arise as stars i say shining forth from the deep your burials like those of men this period in the dua just right for everything that has to be done for regeneration as souls you travel inside the sky at night and then by day withdraw to the boundaries of the sky invisible to sight when seen by the living it is indeed as a star making its journey and shining forth in the sky in the hours of the night traveling the sky to the end